Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to my channel. I know today's a little different than what I usually do because I'm doing audio only, but to be honest, I had a really long week and uh, you know, I wanted to address basically what happened to the channel when it went down last week. So I was as shocked as you guys were and um, I wanted to kind of explain the cycle of events that unfolded when the channel kind of disappeared. For the first time that evening, after I had posted, uh, you know, the new video that I had with um, the audio of Nick Groff, I'd actually heard directly from YouTube. They first started asking me to take this really long survey and they wanted me to answer it honestly about my feelings towards all of the changes since Logan Paul. And then I actually got to speak with someone, which is a very rare occurrence. They were really concerned about their creator community and they had seen me discuss on some of my videos that I actually wanted to leave YouTube. Once uh, YouTube reached out to me, they also asked me to stay, that they would like me to stay. Um, they don't want me to leave the creator community. And basically there were hints that they were going to go back through the channel and hopefully you know, reassess me out of what they were putting me in in January, which was religion. So out of nowhere, after I posted the new video, my channel shut down. Um, my video had probably been up for maybe an hour or two and then the channel disappeared. I did not have warning of this and I was notified that basically it would be up in about 72 hours or less. Officially, the channel was down for about 48 hours. It was good and bad. The um, bad side was there were some videos that were removed. Basically, they were claimed to be vlogs instead of um, what they reassessed the channel as, which is now back to science and reviews. But basically, I'm not allowed to have vlogs on the channel um, because it goes against the majority of my content that's on the channel. So about 10 videos were removed. Um, the new one was included and uh, some from the past. So it ended up being a good thing because we were transferred back to science and reviews. But on the flip side, it was stressful that the channel shut down for a few days. I had no control over it. I had no control over what content was removed. Um, and I'm tired. Uh, they basically removed about 200,000 views from my channel. We were peaking just over 2 million views and they removed about 200,000 views. I don't know why. I don't understand when YouTube rolls back numbers, I really don't get it. There was not, a, you know, a total of 200,000 views between those 10 particular videos. In fact, the, the videos that they removed were some of my lowest viewed videos, so I'm not sure if maybe that's why they removed them. I did have, you know, 44 new subscribers in January, and literally within the 48 hours that those videos were removed and the channel went down, I suddenly jumped up like 150 subscribers, but it was during the time that the channel was down, so I don't know how I would get 150 subscribers while the channel was inactive, but um, anyway, sometimes things that happen on YouTube and things that YouTube controls, nobody can really explain it. So anyway, I hope that you guys can understand why I have this, you know, coming up as a late upload and why it's a bit informal. It was very stressful knowing that the channel went down. I had thought that I'd spent all five years, you know, the last five years of my life working so hard to build this up and then it just kind of disappeared. And so it was a bit scary. The happy thing is, is that they've changed us back to reviews and science. And that makes me feel better in a sense because I don't have to rush as fast as I was planning on, you know, getting out of YouTube. Now I can, uh, you know, focus on the change moving over to Vimo and Twitch, um, you know, kind of slowly. If you guys follow me on Snapchat, Blake and I did just finish uh, building one computer for streaming on Twitch. I will still be planning on beginning streaming in the beginning of March. 
we are in the process of now building the second computer that will be, you know, capable to handle if I do decide to do gaming streaming and or just regular live streaming. I will still be planning on switching over to Vimo. Vimo is free. If you go to vimo.com backslash ghost girl diaries, that is our new platform. We will be slowly making the transition over there and you will be able to access the new website, which is www.ghostgirldiaries.me. That is currently under construction, but if you're wanting to look for new videos, I will embed the videos into the website. So you can go directly to the website to find new videos once we make the switch. You just make a free account to sign up and you can watch videos. I'll also be able to control the content as far as you know, not allowing people to download the videos and move them to a different site without copyright infringement. Unfortunately, YouTube does not um, really back up its content creators if videos are stolen from us, which you can make a free profile. It's free for the first tier. Um, make sure you search Crystal Leandra, and I'll be doing live streaming there as well. Um, like I said, it's free to make an account, and the first tier to you know join my Twitch stream is free. So make sure you access that. A lot of people on the last video say that they were not going to follow me and that they wished that I was staying on YouTube and trying to make me feel guilty about the leave. And I just wanna say to you guys, please don't say things like that to me. Please don't you know, say hurtful things to make me feel bad about going. I didn't want to go. I wasn't planning on leaving YouTube really ever. But unfortunately, when you're not respected as a content creator, I just would ask those of you that said those things to put yourself in my shoes and imagine working, you know, 20 to 30 hours a week on this channel and you're not being compensated properly and they're taking away subscribers and rolling back views. They're removing content that's taken you hours and hours to create. It's a lot deeper than just on the surface. You guys only see the final product which is uploaded to YouTube. You don't see the hours of work it goes into, you know, work on the lighting before we do an upload, the hours of work that goes into, you know, researching topics and trying to find any current events, things that are going on in the media right now. To create one video on this channel is hours and hours of work of multiple people. I put in at least 30 hours a week just into this channel and when you're not respected, and when your employer, such as YouTube or your platform or your network that you're working for, does not respect you and the content that you create, you do not want to continue creating content for them. You know, YouTube will unfortunately end up making more money off of me than I will myself. Um, and it's like, you know, would you work for free for an employer? Would you work for free for an employer without any sort of payout? Like I said before, my payout was never about money. It was about getting subscribers and building a community. And if they take that away from me, then I have nothing left here. So I'm just asking you to be considerate and understanding and kind and not say hateful, hurtful things about my, my leaving and exiting and not say hateful, hurtful things about um, the decision that I'm making to go to a new platform. I would just ask you to be kind and respect the decision that I've made. The change over to the new platforms will probably not be March 1st at this point. I will continue to do weekly uploads on YouTube and Vimeo. I'll probably be uploading the exact same video weekly um, just as a transition process. And as soon as the website is finished, because that's what's taking the longest, that's when I will announce when the official uh, transfer over from YouTube to Vimeo is. Now back to the content. This is the content that I previously uploaded that a lot of you did not get to see. Um, this was a direct uh, stab at me from the department at UNLV after they proclaimed they did not support paranormal film. I did not attend this event. I was provided this um, content from another YouTube creator that uploaded it before me and I wanted to share it with you guys regarding um, Nick Groff's interview with Elizabeth from Ghosts of Shepherdstown. I, I just thought that I was crazy and it, the best way to hide it was just to never talk about these things that have, have happened to me. Uh, and then I moved down for the electrical engineering job to DC from New Jersey, that's where I grew up. 
and I moved into this apartment where I had a ton of activity to the point where I was just like, I need to figure out what's going on in my life. Um, so I found this team and it was awesome because it was comprised of people that either already worked for the government or were prior military. So we were all very logical, had lots of gear, took lots of data, and I don't know, I fell in love with it. So, so that's what the government's doing in their spare time. <laughs> 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 Building crazy contraptions for them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. And then film was the, at the same time that I was doing paranormal, I also started like acting in indie films down and around DC, and I just fell in love with it. After high school, I didn't actually go to college right away. I, I moved to New York City, uh, and I was doing modeling and acting there. So I felt like it was always unfinished business in a way, but. I'm a strange character, so I don't know. <laughs> Acting at first didn't really feel like it would be good for me, but then when I started doing it, I just fell in love with it, and I love to write, so um, we're creating a few films together now, and I'm really excited about that. Yeah, like, incredible writer. Actually, it's really good writer. Yep. Uh, for me, I graduated UNLV in 2004, uh, started going here in 1999. Just find that over here back then. And, um, it's interesting the way life takes you, because I never thought I'd be producing Colonel TV shows in a sense. Colonel has always been a fascination for mine since I was a little kid. My grandmother used to talk to me about Colonel all the time. I actually got into UFOs and extraterrestrials and everything. And I was that weird kid at 13, listening to Art Bell on my little boombox radio, um, saying, I'd have a map on my bed, and my dad would come and be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to Area 51 someday. You know, so I was that strange kid. And a lot of that kind of, uh, over years, just stuck with me. And I always loved film. I was a film fanatic since I was a kid. I've read every single horror movie you could possibly think of. All the VHS tapes, I'd go down the aisle and I'd just stare at them and I'd rent every single one. I'd watch a movie a day, sometimes two. Um, that was my passion for the film. And you really don't understand it until you get a little bit older and you mature and you start understanding your own, you know, your own personality and stuff like that. And I realized that I was a different film. I love films. <laughs> so not until um, I attended UNLV that I really kind of focused all of my passion for that behind uh, filming, editing, pretty much doing anything I can possibly do to create something. Um, but the paranormal always stuck with me since I was a kid, just based on some other experiences. I'm a very logical thinker, so I was always like, all right, I want to see if this exists, right? Um, and I took a field trip. Uh, during 2000, I think it was 2000, 2001, I went to Virginia City, Nevada, I found a pond, Goldfield, and all that, I fell in love with it. And um, then I met two other guys here in Vegas, um, and I said, hey, you guys want to go look for ghosts one day? <laughs> and we had little camera equipment and stuff like that, I took out like, a little bit of money that I had, I had pretty much no money back then, I just graduated, you and me, um, after I did, uh, oh, thank you, sir. After I did, um, work. Yes. Yeah. Forever. Um, so after I actually produced my first film uh, tw at 24, and uh, so when I was 25, I produced my first film called The Love Ones, and uh, it's when Mini DV was kind of coming in with the first 24 frames per second camera with the old Panasonic 100A. And I remember we just got done uh, filming your film, Primo, I think it was. Um, and then we, went to, we were just talking about going to Panasonic and they taught me how to use the, the first HD camera that came out. And I forget what the very kid. The very kid, yeah. So I was the only one who knew how to use the controller that tapped into the camera with all the focus on it, so it was crazy. Um, so when I went to do my first film, I wrote it, directed it, filmed it, uh, I, I did everything. And, um, and I was lucky enough to get into Center Vegas Film Festival when Dennis Hopper was alive and David Lynch was there and Mika Takahashi. And that's when Napoleon Dynamite aired there when no one knew what Napoleon Dynamite was. And I remember sitting in that theater and everyone's like, oh, this movie sucks, it's not that good. I'm like, this movie is genius, it's gonna be huge. And then, the blockbuster. Um, and then my movie aired at the same time and then Lionsgate wanted to pick it up for like some really horrible distribution deal. And I remember, showing you some deal and he was like don't sign it <laughs> so I ended up not signing it and I just held on to it because I really wanted to do other things and then that's kind of where I nonchalantly rolled into wanting to see if ghosts exist and that's when I 
created ghost adventures. So uh, I called the other two guys up, said, you want to go with the ghost? And that's how it kind of all started. And we went out for like months just filming everything, going up all the Nevada to Virginia City, to Tonopah, just filming everything. It was actually a really cool experience. And um, that kind of just turned into a narrative documentary, which back then I didn't even know what a documentary was or how to put it together. I just knew that we had great evidence. It was amazing some of the footage that we got. And I had to mold some sort of narrative into this like great story that kind of was this adventure. So you knew what a feature was, and uh, we worked together to get the levels. So it was City of Vegas, and that was kind of you watched a uh, feature uh, virtual week. Yeah. Uh, and you bid in features, so you kind of knew that. But you really didn't know how television was changing. No. Uh, uh, obviously, you, you, you take it in to television. When you went out and you shot that stuff, did you think I'm shooting a pilot in a couple? Episodes that you just thought of doing a documentary, what did you think? No, I just thought I was going to film some ghosts. <laughs> That's pretty much what I thought I was going to film. I was going to go out there and see if this exists and whatever we come up with for footage, that's what it is. And what was interesting about it is we filmed everything. Like we have hours of footage in this car rides of us just being goofy. And um, it was interesting because not until we got to Virginia City where we had some really amazing experiences that I couldn't explain. Um, I started looking at the footage, I had like 15 mini DV tapes, and I was like, I have the bash capture, back then it was like a go to Premiere 16 class or whatever, and I had like, I was just telling them I had five external hard drives wired together into my computer I built, and I had to edit this, kind of just this clump of mud into like this narrative, you know, it was really difficult to try to figure out, and I knew there was great pieces of evidence and great like structure, but we had to like create this kind of overarching story of what what happened in the beginning and why we're doing this. And I had no clue how the end was going to end because it was a complete documentary in that sense that not knowing it was a documentary. So it kind of turned into what it was when it wasn't even intended to be that. It was just intended to go out and film some stuff, film on journey, and just see what happens. So you didn't have anything like. I'm going to monetize this. You know, a lot of people know that if they become a YouTube partner, they can they can do this, they can do that. Yeah. Or th th there seems to be more clearly defined roads for indie production now, and it didn't really exist in terms of distribution when you when you started. It was really difficult um, because I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker in general. I love writing, I love telling stories. I just love film. I love directing, I just, I love creating in that sense. Um, there was no particular position that I wanted to be. I knew, I thought I wanted to be, oh, this director, this producer, or whatever. But I just overall wanted to create great content and great stories and great things that can be experienced. And that's kind of like how I thought all the time. 24 7, seven days a week, I was just like, oh, I just had a great idea, I'm gonna write this whole script right now. Or I, I wanna go and film this. And I would shoot so many short films. Um, <laughs> which you know, and uh, I just I just had a passion for it. So my intentions for doing what turns into Ghost Ventures, the original documentary, wasn't to make a documentary. It was to make just uh, this kind of adventure, this exploration of like what's going to happen. You know, I knew how to hit the record button on the video camera, and let's just see what happens. And so then, how does that get tamed down to what it became? Right. So. It was blood, sweat, and tears. What I always tell everybody, I've been in this in the TV industry and film industry for about 14 years now, coming out of uh, college. And you know, everyone says it's luck or it's timing. Timing does have a part of it in the TV world or the film world, depending on what the brand or the niche or whatever's happening in that kind of phase of just reality. But I think overall, it's like never giving up is rule number one of a filmmaker. You know, if you really want to make something, you feel deeply passionate about it, there's good, you gotta understand there's gonna be there's gonna be lows and there's gonna be really highs. You're gonna fail and you're gonna climb back up. So I've had a lot of those in um, my life. I've had a lot of letdowns that I thought were great, and I've had a lot of like huge success stories that are amazing. So understanding that and knowing not to give up and not to get so hard on yourself and down is I think what is key to become a great filmmaker, a great person who's gonna create something great and have a career doing it. Um, so that was kind of the starting point for Ghost Adventures documentary is I had this great 
documentary, this great narrative, and I'm showing everybody. We got news outlets. We were doing all sorts of stuff. We were just like, I was like, the world has to, has to see this. This is amazing. It has amazing evidence that's legit. It has crazy, like, this story that needs to be told. So it was really difficult because I don't have any family members that are, you know, tied into like the film industry or the TV industry, and I thought you'd have to enter film festivals to get it shown. So we won two film festivals, Area War Film Festival in Pennsylvania and also in LA. Um, showed it in a small theater. Um, How long? It was about back then. It was like close. It was about an hour forty minutes. So it was like it was a documentary feature. Yeah, yeah. It was too long. It was like. So what happened was, is I was sitting in my apartment, and I was like, this sucks, <laughs> you know? Like, this is great, and I worked so hard on this. And I thought the right thing to do was get this, this Hollywood agency book, right? If you don't know anyone, what do you do? You start flipping through numbers and try to find context. Because the whole industry is about connections, and who you know, and trying to get something somewhere. So I, um, I started going down the list in this old, remember those Hollywood agency book? I think you can still get them today. Yeah, no, we used to talk about them in class. They're ridiculous, number one. No yeah. offense. Yeah. No, no, now we just, you be, know. No, be, it, the, here's the reason why they're ridiculous, is because every single number I called, I talked to an agent, a secretary, or an entertainment law, right? You need somebody to represent you in order to take your, your material to somebody to distribute it, or to sell it, or to pick it up. So the problem is, is like you're talking to these people to try to get it to them, but they don't want to talk to you unless you have representation. So it doesn't make any sense to me. You know what I mean? So I would call a hundred of them, and I got really good at talking on the phone with them in like a split second of like, listen, I got this great documentary. I want you to see it. It's very compelling. We have amazing evidence. We spend our news. That, you know, I would just ramble on until they would say shut up or talk to somebody else or hang up on me. <laughs> so to the point where I got this one person who's like, all right, just mail it to me. I'm like, listen, I'm not gonna mail it to you because I just don't trust mailing it to you. And he's like, I talked him into allowing me the next day to come to LA, and this is a crazy story. It's actually a great story. It's like something out of a David Lynch movie. Go to LA and go to Mulholland Drive, where this house on the hill is, right? No joke, this really happened. And, and back then, my buddy Zach and I were like, okay, he wants us to go to Mulholland Drive up into this house, and he's this agent that he says he's an agent who reps, I guess, for some distribution who can get in the hands of other people. And I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'll be there tomorrow at noon or whatever it was. I think it was like 2 p.m. I get in my little Toyota Echo and I just drive the next morning. And I get up to Mulholland Drive, we park, and we knock on the door. And he, he's like texting me. It was really weird. Uh -huh. I kind of like texting me. It was like weird, right? Yeah. And he, um, this is back in 2005, 2005 or six. And he's like, um, when you get to the house, just come in the house. So I, I think Sally was like, what am I walking into? Like, it feels like a David Lynch movie. And <laughs> we open the door. And it's this nice house overlooking, like whatever, on the and Drive, you know, I'm just like you know, kid with no money, just put this great documentary. And, um, we walk in and we're looking around, like, hello. And no one's saying anything. And I'm texting, like, what the hell is going on? You know, Zach and I started arguing. I'm like, let's just leave the film and, and, and go. And he's like, no, we're not going to leave the film. And I'm like, all right, what do we do? So we start talking about it. And we start bickering to each other because we don't know what to do, you know? <laughs> and uh, we stood there, and all of a sudden, this girl in this robe, right, comes down the staircase, just walks by us, like she's gliding by us. <laughs> and she goes, we'll be back soon. And just keeps walking. I'm like, who's this here? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's going on? I swear to God, I felt like I was being punked. <laughs> and uh, he texted me a little bit later, or I texted him. He texted me. He's like, oh, I got caught up in meetings. I won't be back until 5 p.m. tonight. Oh, Typical, you know, LA atmosphere. Um, so I, uh, I said, all right, well, what kind of cool you want to do? And we're like, let's go to Universal Park. So we went and we rode the rides for a while. <laughs> I think there's still a picture of us, like, me screaming on the, on the long ride going down or something up at Universal. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We came back. He finally showed up. Um, showed him the film. He said, this is amazing. Uh, it's too long, though. He said, you need to cut, like, 20 minutes out of it. It's way too long. Um, 
you know, I worked a year on this. As an editor, you always hate people criticizing in the young phase of the mind. If you work passionately on something, as an editor, I always hated like criticism because you're so passionate about how can I make it better. But it's honestly, I've learned after years of editing so many different shows, like having another set of eyes or listening to other people, being open-minded, is the best thing you could possibly do. Take some criticism, but always stick to what you believe. You know, in edits, especially with the network. Don't let the network tell you to change stuff if you don't want to. But um, it's interesting. We showed them, and I edited it down. And then, long story short, we worked out some agreement. We really hounded the crap out of him to like do something for us. And um, was, he, was he the one that got the deal with the production entity? No. So he, I, we, we hounded him so bad. I hounded him and hounded him and called him. Finally, he did an agreement with us. And I hounded him some more. It's gone for like six months. You know, it's like there's points where you just want to give up. It just really sucks. And then finally, to the point where he's like, "All right, listen, I got this this guy that I know who's a distributor for independent films, um, and he has a contact at Sci-Fi Channel, and he can get into Sci-Fi Channel, and basically that's what happened. So we kind of deal with that guy." The distributor who got it to Sci-Fi Channel. How much did he take from making this? Uh, he took like a small percentage. I don't really? remember. What was reasonable? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was fun. But the problem, like we had some deal with them. Um, then Sci-Fi had a deal with us, which was back then. It's weird. It was uh, it aired in 2007, which was seven air dates that we had a deal for. So which means that they get to air for seven air dates. So seven Fridays out of the year, whenever they want. Right? And they give us a lump sum, here's your money, and pretty much we broke even. We made our money back. <laughs> my little loan I took to my parents to make the documentary really was to buy a camera and some other stuff. And um, not a lot of people know this. I used to shoot wedding videos, by the way, to get by. I'll tell you what, shooting wedding videos, I did like 300 of them back here. I had a deal with Chris Carlton. It's creatively the most interesting thing because you can be a. Back then I was like, making wedding videos that were more cinematic. And it kept my, my artistic flow going, and then I would, you know, shoot all the stuff. And I think that's, you know, any job, if you sort of take the skill set you have, you can you can make things interesting, or you can kind of clock in yeah. or clock out. And I, yeah. I, I just, uh, we're talking about uh, him being in, in Primo right around that time, mm -hmm. when he came back and played this, uh, Russian mobster for us because the, <coughs> the actor didn't show up, yeah. and we shot him with squibs and did all this stuff. And his enthusiasm at like, like, listen, we're gonna cover you in blood. He's like, yeah, this is your, you shoot, yeah. And I was like, okay. And I was just remember how excited he was about like, you're gonna go to Panasonic and you're gonna learn to use this thing over there. Yeah, you know. And so that that yes, that I mean, you know, here sits a much more uh, uh, elegant version of that enthusiastic oh, yeah. uh, guy who's like, we're going to go sit and make yeah. yeah, you know, you're great, you were very yeah. excited. I love learning every everything about filmmaking. I was a PA on a ton of stuff uh, for free. I interned on a ton of stuff just for the love of it. I worked on his stuff. Um, I shot my own thing. I had 70, 70 talking lines in my Malevolence movie. I and mean, it's like crazy how many people I had in that. We blew up a car in Malone's, which was cool. Um, that's a crazy story. And so, towing a car that doesn't have a license plates to go blow it up in the Nevada with the fire department. Just crazy filmmaker yeah, stuff. So you were Don't follow my lead. <laughs> you guys said, <laughs> you brought, you we were definitely car. safe. Mm -hmm. I remember this. this yeah, no, we, this we had all, all the right things. And that's one thing as a filmmaker, always make sure you get the right permits. Talk to the police. The police are actually really cool about filming certain stuff. And everybody in those lines, they're really cool about it. Um, just let them know. And so we're talking about 2007 now? Yep, so 2007, we kind of deal with sci fi. It aired, it did the highest rated, um, uh, what they call it as a show or episodic documentary, whatever. It aired, it did 1.4 million viewership on a Friday night. It was huge. Um, and it did pretty much bigger than any of the other show that they had. And I think at the time, Ghost Hunters just launched season one on Sci-Fi Channel, which was doing really good for them. And um, and what happened was is that's when MySpace just started kind of happening, <laughs> right? And uh, we became like viral on MySpace or something through the documentary. I had some like incredible, like, compelling evidence and took it a prior to analyze. And 
or just this whole like crazy story and how it went from being just an idea of let's go see if ghosts exist is this like crazy phenomenon. And then what happened after that is um, it aired and that was kind of like that. <laughs> and it's like, I had all this great idea because I was so passionate with the experiences we had as like a logical thinker. I'm like, man, we had some good experiences. What are we gonna do now? Because I would love to go to these haunted locations. I'd love to document this. And if we ever have an opportunity, there's a location I just researched and found. My cousin actually told me at Justin about a location called Bobby Mackey's Music Room. And no one knew about it back then. We saw it on a news outlet. And I saw a lot of the guys, I'm like, we gotta go here someday if we ever can do more documentaries or do more of what we're doing. And by chance, um, uh, we got a contact in New York uh, through another guy in Las Vegas who was a production company who said, hey, your documentary was amazing. We, we'd love to talk to you guys about taking that and turning it into a reality show. And I was like, a reality show? What the heck is that, you know? Like, are we gonna, as long as I have full control and do what we're doing, and nobody, it's crazy how it all started, because we went to the network, long story short, I cut this little sizzle reel together, and I didn't even know what a sizzle reel was. What is a sizzle reel? Because I'm not sure that, how many okay. of you know what a sizzle reel is? Oh, okay. interesting, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, people ask for sizzle reels all the time. Yeah. People always pretend they know what it is. What it, what it is. Yeah, so scissor reels are um, interesting. Like, when you go to pitch any TV network, or even even on uh, today, like documentaries or films or producing any, any anything, right? If you want to get distribution money or whatever to produce your material or get it to the next step, like a TV show or film, whatever it is, um, you need something to show for. A lot of people don't even like looking at paper these days. Some stuff is like, they call them decks where you have a show treatment, you'll have your talent attached, whatever is different in it. Whatever so what is it? I mean, it's interesting you use that term. Uh, I don't think they know what a deck. So a deck is kind of like, um, show it? I mean, pretty much as simple as this. You look at a deck, right? If you look at it as like a book, and inside that book, you have certain things that networks and distributors or whoever you're selling something to wants to see because they're financing, they're putting money into it, and they want to know X, Y, and Z, and why am I investing in this? It's very complicated, um, and there's a lot of different production companies will tell you to do it so many different ways. So they have their own, like, like Everybody like has their own style. style. There's no right way to do it, honestly. Every single, like, I talked to Netflix, I talked to HBO, AE, Travel Channel. Pretty much, I didn't have representation when I said, I didn't have an entertainment lawyer, I didn't. I had to learn agreements. I had to learn what what is right, what is wrong. I didn't understand what a like um, um, uh, option was. So when you're agreeing as like talent, because I enrolled in as an executive producer on Clicks of Entries when we created uh, the, the show, show on Trial Show. So I became executive producer, co-host, camera operator, editor. It was like ridiculous. So I had I had all these lines that I was doing, um, and and basically it's crazy how you have to like break everything down, you know, you have to show like, here's the show treatment, here's what it is, here's the people um, that are in it. And for us it was easy because back then like, um, SAG was uh, protesting against it, right? So the first question they asked us at Trial Show, which, which used to be owned by Cox Communications, was, are you guys SAG? And I was like, we're not SAG, we're not actors or anything like that. Like our documentary is what it is. And they're like, okay, perfect. We're signing you guys, we're giving you guys eight episodes. <laughs> So, so it was season one. Season one was eight episodes. I think nine actually. Um, I think one was in a nine. Oh, that was the season two. Season one was eight episodes. Um, it was crazy because the first few. How long? Um, so with so they're an hour hour episode, but with commercials it's 43 minutes. Um, some differ. So there's like 44 minutes. I think it's over the United Kingdom, and then 43 minutes is. TV broadcasts with commercial breaks and stuff. So you have six acts, you know, act one through six. Uh, you have to break each act down. Yeah, so take us through that. What, is, what, are, what are those six acts? So, and all this goes back into the deck, by the way. So the deck has all this stuff, like all the broken down material and everything that is going to be revolving on the show. Um, so you have your treatment, your concept, your talent. Um, sometimes they ask, what's the equipment? That's the format, that's the story structure, all that stuff. Um, breaks down the deck. They would want a sizzle reel. So with us, 
we had the documentary, so it's like we didn't need a scissor reel for it, but I still cut a scissor reel to show, um, which is a funny story, by the way, because I was in Trowel Show in the executive's office, and one of the guys there, he was, he was watching it, and his other buddy was walking by, and he thought it was amazing and all this stuff, but he didn't know how to comprehend and what to do with it. And he probably would have passed on us and be like, all right, guys, have a good day, we'll think about it. That's mostly what the corporate world says. And his buddy was walking by who was really into it, and he grabbed him, and he's still my buddy till today. He works at Discovery on my other show, but uh, he brought him in, he's like, oh, we just went to the bathroom, what's up? <laughs> he's the one that picked up Ghostbench. It was insane, it's like the right timing, the right person who believed in it, got behind it, and back then it was a small group of people at Trout Show that really believed in it. And it did huge in season one, and then season two was like, we went from doing eight episodes to 26 episodes a year. It was insane. Yeah, it was insane. We're doing two a month. Um, what did you sleep? Uh, I did it. And I actually had to eventually stop being the editor um, because how it would happen is it was many DV tape back then too, so it sucked. So we, I'd carry my own camera to the airport. We'd film our whole lockdown and Monday through uh, Thursday, um, like interviews and adventure scene and then our investigation. Then I'd take all the tapes back home with me. I would batch capture everything, go through the evidence, go through the stuff, and we'd put the story together depending on what happened, what evidence we came up with. And that's how we put out episodes. Then we'd send that to New York, they would buy it, and they'd send that to the network. One of the questions I asked you at lunch was, well, how much of this is scripted? I mean, do you know that when you go to a place that you're going to have to have uh, this or that? And I was just astounded. You know, we've talked throughout the years, but I've never felt like it was a polite question to ask. <laughs> like, yeah. do you script this right, paranormal right. stuff? Because what if the what if the answer is like, I can't tell you that or something? It's just weird. And so, but I felt reality's been around yeah. for long enough that we can ask that question. We send a lot of people to AFI when we're talking about Kai who wants to be an editor, that a lot of the editors and production designers go out and immediately get a job. And most of our editors that graduate from AFI go immediately into the album first. And stay and make great six-figure incomes uh, editing reality. And a lot of the stuff is manufactured stuff by the producers. That's not the case. No, that wasn't the case. So Ghost Adventures and my other show, Final Lockdown, like it's Paranormal Lockdown Ghost Adventures is totally documentary. It's that's how crazy it is. And they even thought we were crazy because they weren't used to it. So we were breaking all sorts of rules. Um, Paranormal Lockdown especially, we live there, it's my other show I do, I live there in supposedly haunted locations for uh, three days straight, 72 hours. It's brutal. It's probably the hardest thing I've done in my life. Um, and it's complete documentary. Like we know the story of the location, we know the history, and we have to fact check all of the deaths and everything. Legally we have to. So we go through the routine to my legal team, then we go through the legal team at Discovery uh, that we do the show with. And then we go into the location and we know who we're gonna interview on Monday and who we're gonna talk to. Usually the owner, the manager, or eyewitness accounts. Um, after that, we are pretty much there. So we're there on the property for 72 hours and we just document our whole entire um, you know, experience. And really, the idea behind Paranormal Lockdown isn't like to prove ghosts exist or debunk ghosts exist or whatever, however you want to define the supernatural paranormal in that realm. The idea that I have is like, let's discover something new as human beings, right? Maybe we can possibly try to find out, like maybe that's what this is, X, Y, and Z. It's actually not what we could comprehend, or science hasn't driven that far enough with technology to discover what we think is more explainable could be a possible thing within our universe. So that's kind of the idea behind Colonel Lockdown. We film from Monday through Friday, we leave. Uh, 72 hours, we shoot testimonies on Thursday. We do some uh, recreations, a little bit of like the stories that are told so we can cover that with footage. Um, but pretty much it's straight up documentary. <laughs> what you see is what you get, there's no script. And so you you were saying, and I uh, before I interrupted you, that you had to give up the editing. When did you do that? Was that in oh, for those pictures? Yeah. So after season one, I was I edited the whole season one, um, 23 minutes half of the show. And New York would do that at 23, which was just the first part of it, Act One, which is the interviews and the build of the story. But I did all the investigation, everything. Um, 
It was just too much. You know, I was on the road, so I was traveling to a location, filming, come back, editing, turn around, go back, film, come back. It's like I was living out of like my little apartment slash little office that we used to have. Um, it was crazy. Yes. And, and so, parallel to that, you're you're studying electrical engineering after a stint as as an actor in a model in New York. And you decided, and do you finish four years as an electrical engineer? Uh, so I, I actually went back to school after being in New York. Uh, and then I I wasn't finished my degree yet when I started working for the DOD. It started off as a internship for the first year, and then um, they wanted to hire me. And I said, OK, well, are you OK if I finish my schooling down in DC, and I can come work on five every day instead of five. So, it's a very unique situation because uh, the branch that I worked for, they usually only hire people if um, they have like doctorates. So I was like jumping at the chance to get part of this, and I went down to DC. But honestly, if that never happened, I probably would have never reapproached film or even pursued the paranormal the way I did. So going back to what you said earlier, it's just strange how things work out sometimes. So at the end of your stint of the the DOD, what year is that? Oh my gosh, um, 2015. Oh, okay, so, so if we move that back five years, you, have you seen him on TV? How, how do you, have you actually watched the show? Did you know no, how? No, I, um, so I, 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 yeah, yeah, we're just kidding. Um, I knew of the show, but I didn't know that he was somebody that watched it, you know, But um, no, I, I, I heard about them. I wasn't really into paranormal TV. I just wasn't really into reality television. Right, I mean, that's, it, it has kind of a stigma. I never it. thought I'd ever be on a reality television at all. Like, I didn't, it's just too much for me. Um, but I was, I've always been so in love with the paranormal that when I was approached by Chief King, who uh, is from the show and the chief of Shepherd's Town Police Department, to do it, I, I was just like, I was bored that we would be able to investigate an entire town. I thought that that was such a cool opportunity, especially being so in love with paranormal. And I had just left the DOD. It was a perfect time for me to just do something different with my life. It's really like what it was for me. And so that was your opportunity? For yeah, and I never heard of Destination America. I mean, <laughs> most, most people never heard of Destination America. So I was like, oh, no one will see this. It doesn't matter. I'm just doing it because I, I love the paranormal. Um, I, so I didn't anything that it became, definitely. And he wasn't even supposed to be doing the show at yeah, first. Um, it was Ghost of Shepherd's Sound, the show that we did. Yeah. So it was it was interesting how um, they kind of called him in at the last minute, really covering the spot, actually, for well, they, um, it was weird. somebody it was, that was supposed to be doing it. Yeah, so the other show she talked about was Ghost of Shepherd's Sound. It was yeah. weird because I wasn't going to do that because I was prepping it to start doing film a lot now. And not really right after. Yeah. Right after that, yeah. So I, I had this huge idea of kind of like a living location, something crazy, and you know, it, it became what it is. Um, and Shepherd's Town was interesting because I've always been against like, who's the production guy that's going to be telling me to do things? Because I'm totally against that. Because <laughs> I've always been like, I have to be like, paranormal is such a touchy subject. Like, I like to be in control of evidence because I don't want someone else to be control of telling me to go over there and stand there and do whatever. That's just not me. I want to be like as honest and legit as possible, and this is what I do. And I'm going to document like a documentary filmmaker. And that's where I came from. Like, remember where you came from, your roots, and raw, and you know, legitimacy is everything, and my, my base is everything with that. So doing Shepherd's Son was weird. They took a lot of convincing for me to do. Um, and the only reason I did it, honestly, was because the police department was actually involved. And I thought, all right, the police are involved. Definitely is legit. And this, the, the chief of the police department of this whole entire town is talking to me personally about like how they need my help and they have to try to figure out what's going on. And I said, you know what? Let me come down there and I'll check it out and see what happens. And I started documenting it. And that's what turned into meeting Elizabeth 
uh, because they already talked to her, and then uh, doing the Ghost of Chapter Zone. And it's yeah. this weird journey. So that's 10 seasons of Ghost, Ghost, Ghost Adventures. Yeah. How many seasons of Shepherd Cove? So we did, so I did over 100 episodes of Ghost Adventures, plus the doc, and I did a, I produced a seven hour live show too, which was crazy. Uh, that's a totally different story. Producing live shows are insane for cable. Um, and then I went on to do another show, Ghost Talkers, that I produced, and then another show called Vegas Script, which was here in Las Vegas, which was insanely hard to do, which is a lot of red tape. I got a casino on board to film the whole working atmosphere. Yeah, well, well, which, which casino was it? Uh, South Point. So yeah, the right. owner of South Point, his son, my neighbor knew them very well, and uh, that's how I was able to get in the door there. And I said, I would love to film what's happening at South Point, but not what everyone sees, everything that's going on behind. Back of the house. Yeah, so there was all these, like, we did that with Travel Channel, we did a ton of episodes, we did a bunch of episodes with them. Um, produced that, it was just a lot of red tape. It was just, it's just really hard when you work with, um, the problem with, like, pitching and producing TV shows, you have to be super unique and you have to have an access. Access is everything, by the way. If you want to sell a show and stuff, have some sort of unique access to something that no one else has, that you can create like a concept or a show after, and you can make 100 episodes. Like that's what networks want, just thinking about it. Now, with Paranormal, what you needed to have is a lot of research so that you could say, this is a map of paranormal stuff that we can be on the yeah. deck, right? Well, the cool thing with, with me and my cousin Justin, who we grew up together, we've been, he actually grew up in a hot house, and he's the most logical person in the world. Like his, his brothers are electrical, uh, electrical engineers? Oh no, mechanical engineers. And um, super smart family, and they grew up in a hot house. They talk about it to this day when they have a couple glasses of wine, they'll talk about it, but they're so logical about it, it's crazy. And uh, it's interesting, but we've been researching locations all over the world since we were little kids. So I have like endless list. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so you said that, that, that Area 51 to, yep. to paranormal stuff was something that was part of you even when you were addicted to film and you thought of yourself as film. And then on the flip side, we did two seasons that goes to Shepherdstown. Um, and then what's cool about us partnering up and everything um, with both of our backgrounds and everything we do, uh, we decided to start our own network. So now we own a right. network, online streaming platform. So, and I believe that that is the future of what TV will be, become. You know, you have the Netflix, the Amazons, and all that. And the cool thing is I know all of them. Like, I know the executives at Netflix, I know them at Discovery, and the cool thing with us is we have deals with Discovery for our shows, as far as talent and executive producers and all that stuff goes. But the general manager and everyone over there is super cool with us, and they're like, this is an amazing project. We want to get behind it, but there's a big merger that's happening right now. Discovery, so public news. Um, so they gave us the blessing to do this and probably come in a little bit down the road. But. So uh, you used the term when you were talking about uh, the cable networks, you said talent manager? Um, Is that what you said? Uh, like, like some sort of person in-house that would, that would deal with talent? Is that? Oh, oh, with uh, networks, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Within the yeah, within the network you have all sorts of different positions. You'll have like somebody who works with the talent, that's the, the, the job, you know, they coordinate with all the multiple talents ac across like the so is that, is that is that like uh, content producers or is that, is that um, celebrities that like are in the shows? Yeah, it's like the hosts and stuff of the shows, so they'll deal with them and deal with all their stuff and everything. And so, but, but you were in this weird place where you were the creator and also in the show? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so executive producer for TV is like the position who basically calls all the shots and is the creator of the show. They really don't put creator of on you know credits. Usually it's executive producers, then everything kind of falls after that. Um, uh, which is interesting because when you get into like scripted series and stuff like that, I've pitched several scripted series. Um, you know, it's totally different in each category that you kind of fall under. It's really weird. So, uh, yeah, I was just gonna ask if um, so they didn't offer you an editor the first season, or were you uh, adamant on trying to edit it yourself? I was adamant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was totally adamant. Because yeah. I mean, you know, it's like you work so hard on the doc, you kind of formulate this structure and stuff. And I just, I really just didn't want 
it to be like tainted in any way, you yeah. know, because when you get into the network world, they like to they like to try to change things as, as what they think is clever and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I just know what's right. I just love sticking to like like knowing what's right and knowing you know you have to give and take a little you know because they're financing pretty much. But I think ultimately um, it was weird because we would sit in a room with a bunch of executives in the beginning and they would be like, all right, we want to do this, we want to do that. I said, no, it's like just the three of us. Like I believe that a paranormal show should be raw, you know, straight up filming. What you see is what you get, right? It should be super documentary as best you can make it. And um, they were like, all right, well, we'll let you do it then. So it was like real kind of challenging story is going to be and you know what's going to happen. But it's a reality show, right? So how is it a reality show if <laughs> you're producing, back producing it? So back producing is like going backwards and producing something. But in content, when you watch it, it seems like it's happening now and nobody knows about it. You know what I mean? Right. So, and so I've heard stories about like, uh, you know, people come in and say, we want you to argue about something. Yeah, exactly. Like, they're 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 like the real world or, you know, right. reality shows. Yeah, right. they're back producing all that stuff. There's right. so many producers that, a lot of reality shows, a lot of people I've met, they, they hate being in reality shows. You have the New Jersey Shore show, you have, you know, whatever, endless. And they create drama from the producers sticking people in positions or creating like, oh, talk about this, or like saying things to them and putting it out there. I mean, they're essentially back producing the show, you know, it's not, sometimes a lot of reality is just happening, but most of the time it's not, you know, for those shows. Um, but there is a lot of really good shows out there. You know? I love watching Shark Tank. Shark Tank is a great show. My daughter loves Shark Tank. I love Shark Tank. Uh, um, which Copro in the TV world is is find another distributor that would put up half the half the percentage of the funds, the money, to finance, so they don't have to put 100 percent in it. And it's kind of like one of those things like we believe in it, but give us some other money somewhere so we can you know get behind it. So that's kind of how co-pros work. It's a whole other story. I thought I thought for years before I even knew what a co-pro was. I thought a co-pro for like ten years <laughs> working with switches was like, hey, we're partners. We're 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 co-proing, produ producing together. But co-pro is actually a distributor. It's funny. Yeah. And um, so uh, you were talking about traction in the UK. So is that is that uh, uh, since since you have good UK numbers, that can be... Uh, yeah, so um, in the UK, uh, a new network, international network, just launched. It's a year anniversary coming up on called Quest Red, and they're a part of Discovery Family in the first international station, and we broke the records for both of our shows, uh, Shepherd Sound, Primal Lockdown. Uh, it's a free view channel, which means everybody in the UK can watch it, which is pretty awesome. So uh, we broke numbers there, and now they're all excited about it. And um, it's good for their uh, Discovery brand overall because if they're international, it's doing good. Now it doesn't become a domestic show; it becomes an international show, which is huge. Um, so it's good for them. All right, for them. We do, we do it for pennies. They do it for <laughs> they get the good success story. Well, then that's that's an interesting thing to talk about. In terms yeah. of as you move into a streaming channel. Uh, you'll be in a bit, you'll probably be in the for a little yeah. bit. Uh, yeah. Being able to sort of get indie, indie talent out there. The key to filmmaking. Yeah, we recently have, yeah. Yeah, we, we definitely have. And the key to filmmaking, I think, and even coming back to Canada, you making a lot of for like $2,500, right? I blow up a car and do all this crazy stuff in it. Um, is like doing stuff for as cheap as you can do it but make it look like a million dollars, right? So Ghost Mention was super cheap to do, and it turned into this like, huge phenomenon. Same thing with Lockdown, um, Colonel Lockdown. Um, I'm not sure what Ghost Shepherd's done, because I don't produce that show. I just was um, an investigator. I was just myself on it. <laughs> so, um, but as far as everything else goes, if you can do content for cheap, and pretty much anybody out there today with technology can go out there and film something incredible with the lenses and the digital capability right now, you can do some amazing stuff. Um, access, you, safety, access, uh, safety, and, and yeah. your ability to be able to make things look much more expensive than they actually are. Yep. So let's take take us through this this uh, this this deck. You want to talk about stuff? Yeah. Here. Uh, 
Um, as far as editing goes, um, did you edit your own software? Did, it, or did you bring your own editing software and edit it to perfection? Um, or did you use what they had, like sort of like Avid or something, as far as editing goes? No, so with my stuff, uh, editing wise, I, uh, crazy enough, like I was a Premiere guy, Adobe, mm -hmm. uh, Final Cut, and I uh, did that all in season one, you know what I mean, and edit on their software and all that stuff. Um, or are you now doing the, um, the Coco? Did you, or have you thought about making your production company and make that easier? Or do you need to worry about that? Like, are right in? So I own my own production company right. now called Rock Entertainment. Um, so when I did Ghost Ranchers, I didn't. It was another production company that the umbrella was under for insurance. But it's like a whole other, like, crazy, like, thing to get into. It's, like, very complicated. You gotta have insurance, you gotta have this, that. It's, like, crazy. Okay, after listening to this, I can tell you guys probably what happened with Nick and Ghost Adventures. A co-pro is basically when you split financial uh, responsibility on a show. So let's say um, if Ghost Girl Diaries decided to merge with a production company, we would have to come to some agreement that Ghost Girl Diaries will fund 50% and the other 50% of the production will be funded by whatever production company that signs us, okay? Once you become successful after a couple of seasons, usually the production company will give the uh, actual company or even individual executive producers options to buy into either the production company um, or you know the cost of the series which means you will have more financial gain more control more power and more stock invested in your own series if you heard Nick what he said was for 10 years he didn't know what a co-pro was so he thought a co-pro meant co-producing not in terms of co-funding so my assumption is every season Zach was buying into Ghost Adventures more and more possibly even Aaron and Nick may not have gotten the proper, um, you know, lawyer or team to be helping him read his contract. And he was not buying into it as much as Zach was. And then when this whole thing erupted towards the end of, you know, Nick leaving Ghost Adventures, he probably realized that whole time Zach had been buying into it and Nick had not. Honestly, from a perspective of someone that has worked on television series before, you are not allowed to discuss your contracts with each other. So even if I took my entire Ghost Girl crew and we signed um, you know, contracts with the other production company to merge with them, as a crew, we would not be legally allowed to speak to each other about our contract because as a host, I'm sure Zach got paid more than anyone else and he probably still does get paid more than anyone else. They are legally not allowed to talk about it amongst each other. So the whole time, Nick probably had no idea that Zach had invested and bought into stock within the co-pro and purchased even more head over Nick. And that's probably why he went behind their back and signed contracts with Discovery and uh, Destination America. Which sadly, you know, when he decided to do that behind their back, we know it's a fact that he was fired from Travel Channel and Ghost Adventures. And if Zach did have purchased more stock or head with the co-pro, that means he did have a decision in the process, which technically, since Nick did, you know, make three other shows with another network, that is a definite illegal breach of contract. So sadly, he did bring it upon himself. This is no one's fault. No one's more at fault. The only person that's really at fault here is Nick not knowing his filming terminology and contract terminology and not surrounding himself with, you know, a proper legal team to be able to analyze his contract and help him with his, you know, future outcome of what Ghost Adventures could have became. Um, so when I branched away and I did kind of lockdown, I started growing up entertainment. Well, I had grown up entertainment years before, but I started my actual official company. And under that, we um, do parent lockdowns all grown up entertainment through the production company. We have an office in New York. We edit everything in New York. And, um, and then we have our office in Virginia where we do uh, video space. And that's a whole other side of the production company. So we own, we're not just an online streaming platform, Space, but we're also a production company too. So we produce seven live shows a week and they roll out for eight weeks.
and they're all live broadcast streams. But then we also uh, take original content. We can get into all that stuff. Yeah, we'll talk about that. I get going, sorry. I'm like hyperactive ADD in my head, so I'll just like. Me too. I'm um, like frustrated that. That's gonna be it. Yeah. But before I do about the low files, I say that. It's not so how do you protect yourself on the <laughs> deck? Does your does does it automatically go to your? Uh, uh, it, do you copyright it in any way, or do you trademark the, the name? Do, what, what is Some of it you do. Yeah. Here's the problem, like, all of you have concepts right now that everyone's probably doing similar right now, out there doing it right now. So that's the hard part. And growing up, I've had three shows ripped off from myself. So I get it. Like, those are the hard times, and you just have to realize that it's going to happen. And even if you think you're being ripped off, it's probably like you're not being ripped off. It's just coincidence. People are just think of the same thing. And there's been every show that's already been done. It's all about relationships, working hard, thinking outside the box, and really just driving yourself to get out there to the right person that believes in your material. It doesn't matter if the person next to you is doing the same thing, but it's a matter of getting to that other person, you've got a network or wherever it is, to present it. And I think that's the obstacle. You know, so the meeting will come first, then the deck? Uh, or sometimes it's just say send the deck? Well, first have representation. Right. That's the, <coughs> that's the hard part to find. It's getting someone to represent you. It's so difficult. Um, and if you don't have anything to show for, then they probably won't even pay attention to you. I've pitched about 100 shows to every now you could possibly think of. I'm friends with all the executives. It's just you have to be willing to have someone say no to you 100 times so you find out that one. And all it takes is one, I'm telling you, like, Ghost French was a great door opener, but it was like this for me. And I still, it still wasn't there. You know what I mean? It's really difficult. You can't be a one-hit wonder in this, like, whole niche of, like, a market. It's crazy. You have to be a brand. Like, everything is about brand, and we're big on brand. So if you can create a brand that just can spiral, you know, and become this phenomenon. That's what's great about the internet these days. It's a scary place. Right, because anyone can go on the internet and do their thing. But it's like, how do you stand up from everyone else doing what they're doing? So it just depends. It depends on what you want to do. It depends, you know, like the next step you want to go after. But I believe that, you know, streaming is definitely the, the place to be for the future. Yeah, so it went from scripted, like we were talking about in the beginning, the 90s, whatnot. They had great scripted shows, like you had the X Files shows and all that stuff. Uh, then it skated into reality, which was the real world and all that crazy stuff. Then it went into this kind of spark of like generation of reality shows. Um, then you had like a, a million paranormal shows all of a sudden after <laughs> movie-ish like cinematic, cinematic episodic uh, television. So I wrote a whole um, scripted series that was amazing, and um, I had some really good people looking at it and. All of this, they said, well, do you have a major director attached to it? So it's also access to known yep. talent. You know, is it, is it, are you co- Or are, something. Yeah. It, it can be... Going off of what they're saying, they're basically stating that in order to be successful, you know, in reality, documentary, or paranormal, you have to have a brand and you have to have known talent, which is why I'm really crossing my fingers for Ghost Girl Diaries because now I'm known and my brand is Ghost Girl Diaries. Like I've had huge talent that have major social media following, but then the network's like, yeah, but I don't know still. So, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense sometimes. Um, just depends where their heads are at too, what their ad sales are, what their demographic is. Every network's different. So it really depends uh, from a network's perspective on what they want to like take on and how many projects and what the relationship is with the production company and if it gets analysts. So many excuses, you know? also why there came a point for when we were working together that we were just like, you know, we would love to be able to have a platform and a space for things, ideas, people that we really believe in, that a lot of networks would just say, no, this doesn't work for us, or whatever their excuses would be for not having it on their network. Talking about doing like live investigations. Right, and, uh, and then we were just like, no, let's make it more than that, because we love the space everything, every genre, not just, you know, the brand that people know us from, but get back to, like, what we truly love, which is film. So that, that's why we got together with Justin, who we've been talking about, his cousin, and uh, the three of us co-founded Witty Space, 
which is our online network. And the first channel we ch channel we re released recently yeah. was the haunted space. And uh, like we said, we had seven live shows, but we're just recently acquiring all kinds of content, which has been the most fun for me. Because we're getting people from all over the world too. Yeah, we were talking. Uh, one day I was, I, we were traveling or something. I said, you know, we started opening up all original content and acquiring films, documentaries, whatever the case is, and where I came from. But I think the idea was, is the way we brand ourselves, and it's just strategic mar marketing, a great business plan, and really just going after and tackling. So like Elizabeth was saying, the first channel we opened up under VidiSpace, VidiSpace is like that Netflix, right, or Amazon. And under that, our first channel will be the haunted space. And it made sense to us because we're already branded in that category as a business plan. Let's release this, let's tackle and focus into this genre first because I already know everybody in this field. So we're grabbing all these people of all walks of life that have like amazing shows or doing something or whatever it is. That we've met along the way during our time yeah, so yeah. now we have them on their own show and their own platform, we get behind them and we market them. Um, and then we're going to be releasing, and when you see our website, you'll you'll see we're going to be releasing like the travel space, the crime space, uh, whatever it is. It's like endless documentary space, space, yeah. space, live music space. Live music. Because uh, we, we've kind of structured it to be a bit different, because right now we're doing like kind of an East Coast tour in a sense, because we're filming all these live shows, and everyone's pretty much on East Coast, except for some people that were flying out from LA. Um, so during the course of producing these live shows every week, we're also taking on interviews and um, working in small pieces along the way. So it's more cost beneficial because we're a young company. You know, we're just starting. Usually it's opposite. Usually you, you put a trailer or a cigarette or whatever together, and then you go and you present it to distributor to finance, okay. and then you go and try to do that. Kind of like what um, Robert Rodriguez did for Sin City. You know, he shot that little scene there, which was kind of new with this green screen and his element that he built up. And then he, after he shot that intro scene, he took that to print Will and all those guys and they hit Sin City. Um, similar way to like what we did with this, but we just have great contacts. And merch has contacts to pretty much everybody. So it's easy for us to kind of pull it off. Hell